So, here we are, finally at the end of the Devil May Cry Marathon. Quite ironic that we are finishing this with the game that introduced me to the series. Just like I said at the beginning of the marathon, my very first exposure to the series was Devil May Cry 4. For the longest time, the only things I could remember were two cold white haired dudes, a demonic hand, and a frog. A gigantic frog. Little did I know it would take me about 7 years to finally experience the whole thing with the release of the special edition in 2015. But what makes it so special? You know, additional playable characters, costumes, better resolution, frame rate, and an additional difficulty mode, which is why it's the version I'm reviewing for this video. Just a side note, I always thought it was underwhelming that this game was digital only in the West. Just look at this cover, it looks so great! Also, did you know that in Japan the special edition came in a pizza box? But let me tell you, that's a very expensive pizza box. Without further ado, let's jump into Devil May Cry 4 and see if we can somehow top the masterpiece that is DMC3. The game opens up with not Dante this time around, but rather a new main character named Nero, hurrying to a ceremony held by the Order of the Sword, a religious organization who hails Sparta as a god. In the Opera House, we are shown that Nero has quite the hots for this girl named Kidie, but the ceremony is cut short when Dante busts in from the ceiling and assassinates what will be this order's equivalent of the Pope. Oh yeah, this old man's name was Sanctus. Keep that in mind. This ensures a fight between Nero and Dante, causing the former's right arm to awaken in the form of the Devilbringer. Due to tradition at this point, Dante gets impaled with his own sword and warns Nero about suspicious actions within the Order while making his escape. Adios, kid. Kiria's brother Credo instructs Nero to hunt down Dante to answer for his crimes on assassinating Sanctus. And afterwards, it's pretty straightforward. Nero comes across a few demons summoned through Hellgate, he meets up with Gloria, a seductive member of the Order of the Sword, and Sanctus is revived by fusing his soul with that of the demon with the assistance of the alchemist Agnes. Nero eventually reaches an underground laboratory where he is overpowered by Agnes and his armored knights, but Virgil's sword, the Yamato that the Order just happened to have, repairs itself and helps Nero to awaken his devil trigger powers and escape. The Order of the Sword plans to awaken a statue known as the Savior to act as a false messiah to the people, but in order to do so, they require the Sparta Sword, which they already possess, and someone with the blood of Sparta. But since Dante is proving too difficult to catch, they go after Nero. Sanctus orders Credo to hunt down Nero, and they duke it out in a battle with the latter emerging victorious. But this victory is short lived as Kyrie, who just happened to be near the area, gets kidnapped by Agnes. Nero makes his way into the HQ, fighting Dante yet again. Dante is motivated to recover Virgil's Yamato since it belongs to his family, but allows Nero to keep it once they take care of the bigger threat. So Nero fights Sanctus, but gets caught and absorbed by the Savior along with Kyrie, with Credo getting murdered in the process, so it's up to Dante to take care of everything. So he goes back to the city, kills Agnus, recovers the Yamato, destroys the Hellgate, fights the Savior, and helps Nero to escape from his predicament. So Nero beats the shit out of Sanctus and destroys the Savior once and for all with his Devil Bringer and has a private time with Kyrie. Dante on his end just lets Nero keep the Yamato, gets poorly paid, and sets out for another job. And that's pretty much the best way I can sum it up. The story is straight to the point, but it's clearly incomplete. It tries to plant some seeds, but makes nothing out of it. Look at Nero, our new main character. One thing that the game never tells you directly is that he's Virgil's son, hence why he can use the Yamato and why he has the Devil Bringer. This naturally makes him Dante's relative, but the game doesn't make a good effort to deepen this connection. Another good example is Gloria. Did you notice how I never mentioned her again during the synopsis? Well, that's because her existence is pretty stupid. She's treating these guys, tasked to infiltrate the Order of the Sword and get information out of them. But what info does she get and what does the crew do with it? Jack shit. Her infiltration means nothing. In fact, she gives the source portal to the Order in order, no pun intended, to quickly gain their trust. But all this does is make their plans easier to achieve. Lady is also here, she appears for about 3 to 5 minutes in total and... That's it. The story clearly needed more work, but there's something that salvages it, and that's the dialogue that accompanies the main characters. Nero now takes the center of the stage, so it's natural that they give him the proper focus. You can get a good idea of his personality just by looking at him. He's the cocky, hot-headed kid that taunts his opponents despite the danger. He's quite of an anti-social person, but still deeply cares for those he loves. I consider him a very likable character, but his personality lacks in comparison once Dante takes the spotlight. 
Dante doesn't really go through any character development this time around. For him, this entire adventure is just another hustle to get his bread, but he compensates this by just being himself. The best moments in the story happen because of his dialogue. Every time he shows up, every time he opens his mouth, it's a spectacle. And I mean that literally. <laughs> you are from the position of my quest. He has grown up, he's wiser and definitely more experienced, but he doesn't lose that laid-back attitude that made him so lovable in DMC 1 and 3. The rest of the characters are... okay, I guess. I mean, Lady and Trish are just there, Kitty is your everyday damsel in distress, Credo in my opinion had a lot of potential as he's the commander of the Order of the Sword, but his loyalty and ideas are put to the test when the Order betrays him and kidnaps his sister, forcing him to team up with Nero. And I like where that was going, but he just gets killed a few minutes later. It's not a bad basis, but it should have been fleshed out better. Sanctus, the main villain of the game. If you ask me, he's a fucking piece of shit. Never before in the series did we have an antagonist this hateable. In the story, he's a manipulative backstabber, and in gameplay, his final boss fight is so goddamn annoying. Either because he constantly runs away from you, or because he never shuts his goddamn mouth. Look at this shit in green, he clearly knows he's an asshole and we hate him. I find it effective in some ways, you know? He's awful for sure, but that makes beating him up more satisfying. Do you know what's one of my absolute favorite things to do in this game? This particular move. That just feels so good. But if there's a villain who stands out in this game, that is the alchemist Agnus. He has enough screen time, a lot of great dialogue, and some standout characteristics that define his character. And his boss battle is fun and challenging, so yeah, that's another thing salvageable. There's an interesting setting here and a healthy number of characters to back it up, but it really falls short and there's a reason for that. Devil May Cry 4 had a pretty tight development which caused Capcom to rush the game. The story suffers from it, but this rush is more apparent when you see how this game is structured. Let's put it this way, first you travel from Fortuna City to the Order's HQ as Nero, then some story events happen and the rest of the game is playing as Dante, going from the Order's HQ to Fortuna City. Dante will travel through the same places as Nero with some slight variations while still fighting almost the same bosses. In one playthrough, you'll visit the exact same places a minimum of two times, and after multiple playthroughs, it feels very repetitious and it really starts to wear you down. You are forced to fight almost all the bosses in the game a minimum of three times, but if there's an area I never look forward to revisiting, that is the Mythis Forest. I despise this place. You spend a total of four chapters in here. It has mazes, this extremely slow and annoying part with disappearing platforms where you're constantly attacked, and if you fall off you must start from the beginning, these annoying plant enemies that if they get you in the middle of a fight, they teleport you to another battle and after that, the fight you were doing previously starts all over again, or the fact that this place is the home of the shittiest enemy in the entire franchise, the goddamn chimeras? Okay, okay, who thought that making an enemy who disrupts your combos at random without clear patterns and deals insane amount of damage was a good idea? Chimeras are awful, but if they combine with an assault, they will become the bane of your existence. To be fair, at least you only have to deal with them in the forest, but everywhere else you can find the blades with their electric shields that take forever to die, the Blanco Angelos that bounce you around with their shields, oh, but nothing compares in annoyance to the Mephistos and Fosts. Okay, I'll admit that they are relatively easy to defeat, but in higher difficulties where everyone's punches damage and where they always come in groups, they instantly become your worst nightmare. Don't you just love when enemies hide behind walls where you can reach them? Isn't it great when you're attacking them they constantly fly away from you? Man, you just gotta love how these assholes can perfectly position themselves in front of the camera and block your entire vision with their cloaks. But if it's not them, sometimes the areas themselves can be your worst enemies. There's a lot of rooms with different sizes, but I can't express how big of a nuisance it is to fight in closed areas, because that's where you come across camera issues. There's still free movement in combat, I'll give them that. But in small rooms, trying to figure out where you're getting attacked from is such a drag. It baffles me to constantly come across these issues because DMC3 almost completely got rid of those problems and having them back again feels so backwards. I know, I probably sound like I hate this game and I wouldn't blame you for that. There's a lot of stuff that really aggravates me in this game. Pisses me off to be more exact. But the truth is, I genuinely enjoy Devil May Cry 4. I think that the positives outweigh the negatives. 
Yeah, sure, the game structure pretty badly and the enemy design is infuriating, but there's a lot to enjoy here. For starters, the boss battles, well, most of them, are still exciting and fun. The soundtrack is a great headbanger and as far as production values go, this game looks incredible. The areas are beautiful, the character models look so clean, and the full HD with consistent 60 frames per second keeps the action intact. And DMC4 delivers on the most important aspect. The gameplay is phenomenal. The game handles and plays in a very intuitive way, just like you'll expect at this point in the franchise. With responsive controls, many different combos, fast-paced action and 5 playable characters, the game excels in what the series does best. At first you'll find Nero is in as buried as Dante in Devil May Cry 3. His only weapons are a sword and a gun, but also lacks any of the styles that refined the gameplay in the past game. It might sound underwhelming at first, but don't let that fool you on Nero's potential. His main gimmick relies on his double bringer that summons a gigantic hand that allows Nero to pull enemies to himself or vice versa. With his buster ability, Nero can also grab demons and execute different attacks depending on various factors, like the type of the enemy or whatever you're on the ground or in the air. Against bosses, you can use the Devil Bringer to counter their attacks in more cinematic and spectacular ways. And his sword, the Red Queen, has a revving mechanic that with perfectly timed inputs makes him inflict tons of damage or change the performance of certain attacks. Nero is a character that is easy to understand, but difficult to master, and it's for that reason that I believe that he is perfect for newcomers. He allows you to understand the combo fundamentals of the Devil May Cry series and lets you get enough practice to exploit enemy weaknesses. It also helps that DMC4 is not as hard as his predecessor, so there's a more forgiving learning curve throughout the adventure. But Dante, on the other hand, is the total opposite. He has three devil arms and three firearms, in conjunction with having four. There are to be five styles that he can change on the go, and what we have here is an extremely versatile Dante that can adjust to any situation and can fit into any playstyle imaginable. The thing is, he takes way too long to play properly. His weapons are some of the weirdest I've ever seen in a game. The devil arm Lucifer that leaves explosive swords that you can reposition with Swordmaster, or the briefcase Pandora that has 666 forms that fill a bar that can transform into a Mega Doomsday machine with the Gunslinger style. Dante's options just seem limitless, and you can taste all of that by constantly changing styles. Sure, you can stick with your favorite one, and make no mistake, we will get your results. But mastering every single one of them brings the most versatile and brutal combat the series has seen by far. Unique to the special edition, there's three extra playable characters, but sadly, all of them go through the exact same stages. The only real differences are some new introduction and ending cutscenes. Lady makes her playable debut here, taking the place of Nero on the campaign. Just like you'll expect from her, she relies heavily on her firearms. She comes along with dual handguns, a shotgun and her Kalina Ann, that also works as her only available melee weapon. Her wire shot sort of works like Nero's Devil Bringer would way less effectively. Lady is quite slow and doesn't have any real combos, and because she's the only playable human in this game, she lacks access to a Devil Trigger. Instead, by feeling what would be her magic icons, Lady can throw a barrage of grenades that can cause a screen nuke. You might find that disappointing, but Lady has some of the greatest damage outputs in this game. Just look at all this damage done with a single special. Trish rejoins the DMC series by being playable once again. Remember? You can actually unlock her in Devil May Cry 2, but I'll be seen dead before I have to beat that game twice in hard mode. She's basically Dante's replacement in the campaign. Bringing the legendary swords part and her electric fists for combat, she excels in speed and the best in combos. Her electric attacks can wipe out hordes of enemies and cause a lot of passive damage. And depending whenever you're using Sparta or not, her bare knuckles attacks change drastically. The thing with Trish is that most of her moves are automatic. You see this incredible looking combo I'm making? All I'm doing is just mashing one button. Trish sacrifices complexity for looks, but does that make her bad? Not at all. Sure, she's easier to use, but that doesn't compromise the depth of the gameplay in the slight list. Outside of the automatic combos, the wider range of options at your disposal never makes the gameplay feel monotonous. Just like Nero, I think she's great for newcomers and a lot of fun to play as. And last, but most certainly not least, Virgil comes back with even more motivation than ever before. Funny enough, he doesn't share campaign with anyone else, it's Virgil from beginning to end. And that just makes me so happy because god damn! For the most part, he's quite similar to how he played in DMC3. He has the quick Yamato, his father's force edge, the powerhouse that are the Beowulf gauntlets and a bunch of summon swords to attack enemies from afar. But now what steroids to all that? His moveset has received a tremendous increase in power, speed and techniques. I cannot put into words how incredible it is to play as Virgil, so I'll put it like this. 
What's the thing that defines Virgil's character? If you answered calm, focused and collected, you will be correct. And if you wonder why I'm asking you this, it's so you can understand how incredible it is that they turn a personality into a combat mechanic. Virgil's main gimmick relies on this new concentration meter. Keeping this bar high enough allows him to perform more powerful attacks, increase the damage frames on the force edge, cause bigger dimensional risk with the Yamato or unleash some ridiculously powerful charge attacks with Beowulf. There's a few ways to increase the bar, such as successfully landing attacks, dodging enemies by simply being standstill or by walking. But stuff like running away, jumping, getting damaged or missing attacks makes the bar plummet down. This gameplay style requires you to keep your cool and be focused at all times. In other words, you must play like Virgil. Keeping the concentration meter high enough and see all the crazy and powerful moves you can pull off is such a sight to behold. It creates a bigger connection with the game. The player becomes Virgil. And that's a sense of immersion not many games can achieve. If I am to rate these characters from my favorites to my least favorites, I will say... Virgil for the power, speed and immersion he conveys, Dante for the seemingly limitless potential, Trish for her simplicity and destructive power, Nero for his accessibility and satisfying Devil Bringer mechanics, and finally Lady. The emphasis on gunplay, while fun, makes the combat a little bit slow for my taste. I like this game, I really do. On many instances, I consider it superior than Devil May Cry 3, but it's held back by its flaws. The special edition has a lot of content, 5 playable characters that play in very unique ways is nothing to scoff at, and the extra costumes and difficulty modes encourage replayability, but that's very counterintuitive because, special edition or not, it doesn't change the fact that the core design of DMC4 is inherently flawed. And that's why this game is quite tricky to recommend. All these campaigns are exactly the same, some areas and puzzles feel like time wasters, and some enemies might drive you to break your controlling frustration. There's a lot of bullshit to go through here, be aware of that. But past all that, there is a very stylish action game with an extremely rewarding and refined combat. And just for that gameplay alone, it's really worth a shot. Since I first got into the series a few years ago, the Devil May Cry franchise has become quite important to me. When it comes to action games, they are some of the first names that come to my mind. They have my admiration because they earned it, and there's a lot to enjoy in these games. Well, maybe with the exception of DMC2. The main characters are so likable and memorable, the gameplay is stylish and satisfying. For every entry, there's a constant growth that adds more depth to the core mechanics. The soundtracks add to the immersion, and the challenge always induces an excitement that keeps the players on their toes. I recommend you guys to try this series if you have never given it a shot. Don't be turned away by the difficulty. There's going to be a lot of frustration throughout the way, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But just like I said on my DMC3 review, it's gonna pay off so well. Remember, a wise man once said, Hey kiddo, remember you're only casual if you give up. Before I leave, I want to quickly comment on Devil May Cry 5. You know, when I'm anticipating a game, I tend to avoid trailers or gameplays because there is a chance I get overhyped. And when I get the game in my hands, it doesn't exactly deliver what I was expecting, or worst case scenario, it just disappoints me. But with Devil May Cry 5, all the trailers that have been released by far show a lot of promise. Every single one of them has perfectly captured the essence of the series. My excitement for this game cannot be described. And I put all my faith in Hideaki and on his team that they would deliver a masterpiece in the action game genre. With that, we conclude the Devil May Cry Marathon. It was a lot of fun to replay the entire series in anticipation for the bigger fish. Again, I hope you folks can give it a shot and see what makes the game so special and who knows, maybe it can captivate you the same way it did for me. So anyway, thank you guys so much for joining in and I really hope you had an enjoyable time. You better take care of yourselves because I'll be seeing you next time. I don't know, I don't know.